it's been an unforgettable year with challenges no one could have imagined. As COVID-19 has shocked us here in Ireland and around the rest of the world, many of us have begun paying more attention to issues that affect us at a global level. And there is no more pressing issue than the climate crisis. Behind the headlines of the pandemic was a record year for climate catastrophe. Out of control fires, floods, supposedly one-off storms, in the future, the climate emergency is forecast to be far more damaging than COVID-19. But is Ireland's response on track? Our government has promised to decarbonise our economy, and they have pledged to do this at an unprecedented rate. I want to find out how we can actually do it. In this programme, I'm going to examine Ireland's ambitious new route to tackling the climate crisis and what it'll mean for you and me. documents rarely elicit much more than the rolling of eyes. They're not exactly something that most of us read. But in the last year, COVID-19 has thrown the entire world off kilter. Here in Ireland, it has shaken the foundations of our political landscape. And this is the result. In the days before the programme for government was agreed, Ireland was in turmoil. Unemployment had spiked to over 20%. 40% of us were working from home. Cars stayed parked, flights grounded. Entire industries paused. All of us have been touched by the virus. The calamity couldn't help but find its way here. COVID-19 is literally the starting point for the programme for government. Right here on page one, it says, in the space of a few short months, our world has turned upside down. Lives have been lost and hearts broken. And our lives and livelihoods have been changed utterly. As we all rallied to stop COVID-19, we began accepting the advice of our scientists like never before. Taking this document at face value, it appears the scientific evidence pointing to the catastrophic effects of global climate change is now also being accepted. Our objective is to contribute positively towards a wider global response to how we shape the post-COVID recovery and also to how we lead as an exemplar in decarbonising our economy. Is this just political jargon? Or can Ireland actually be a global leader and an exemplar in decarbonising our economy? In this programme, I want to find out. To start, I'm meeting with political economist Dr Aidan Regan to understand the carbon emissions targets that Ireland has signed up to. The government have said that they want to reduce carbon emissions by 7% every year from 2021 onwards. They want to halve carbon emissions by 2030 and they want to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The challenge is, how are they going to do it? And what type of structural changes will be need to be made in Irish society in order to reach those targets? Because they will be a legal mandate. Do you think that they can do what they want to do by 2030 and, and how? So the government cannot afford not to do this. If they don't, there's going to be, quite frankly, climate catastrophe. So the question is, what kind of fiscal policies, what kind of economic policies, can government implement that on the one hand generates economic growth while simultaneously reaching the climate target. And I think that that requires using the tools of public investment to invest in public infrastructure, to invest in public transport, to invest in new forms of energy, to be the state to be the leader in terms of generating renewable energy, investing in wind, hoping the private sector follows. It effectively means banning the cars from our cities 
and then to generate some sort of capacity to get around through light rail networks or encouraging people to use their own form of transport, cycling. They're just small measures. So that, that, that's the type of shift that needs to take place. But it can only take place if there's a change in mindset by government and by the people. And I think in order to generate awareness of that mindset shift, that requires leadership. It's hard to fathom the scale of the task at hand. Not only do we need to decarbonize our way of life, it has to be done quickly. The question is, how can we do it? Many researchers point to 1930s America for an example of how deep and structural changes can transform an entire country, and crucially, how government can be the catalyst for this transformation. America was sunk deep in the Great Depression. Manufacturing had fallen by one third. A quarter of the population were unemployed. Banks went bust. Farmers foreclosed. Bread lines stretched down the street. When Franklin D. Roosevelt became president in 1933, the economy was at rock bottom. So he came up with a bold plan, a programme of credit and investment in America's infrastructure. We have built a granite foundation in a period of confusion. That foundation of the federal credit stands there broad and sure. It is the base of the whole recovery plan. Roosevelt named his programme the New Deal. In just two years, government bankrolled nearly 35 thousand infrastructure projects. Bridges, dams, hospitals, national parks, an entire road network. By pouring money into infrastructure, America transformed into the world power that we know today. The New Deal has also become a model for how a green transformation can take place in the European Union. Member states, including Ireland, are being encouraged to heavily invest in renewable infrastructure. It's called the Green Deal. To learn more about it, I've come to Skibbereen in West Cork to meet with Dr. Paul Dean. What does this idea of a Green Deal even mean? So the name Green Deal is actually a name given to climate legislation f coming from Europe that actually looks at how we use energy within the wider economy. And the vision is really about resetting our current economy. Our current economy in Ireland and in Europe, you know, we, we consume too much, we waste too much and we pollute too much. And the Green Deal is a conceptual legislation that looks at getting to the core of those issues and trying to address those problems. The EU's Green Deal is pushing us to reset our economy in order to lower our carbon emissions. This will involve large-scale electrification of transport and a change to how we heat our homes and power our industries. The work that lies ahead is colossal. But Paul thinks of it differently. He's agreed to illustrate for me the nuts and bolts of how our energy production must change. And why, for Ireland, it could be a good thing. Paul, do you want to tell me a little bit about what we are looking at here on the table? Yeah, this table represents the types and the volumes of energy that we use each year in Ireland. We spend about 12 million euros each day in importing energy. And these are the various types that we have. So over on your side, we have oil. About half of our energy today comes from oil. And oil, of course, is used primarily to power our vehicles, keep planes in the sky, keep trucks on the road, but also to keep our homes warm. If we come a bit closer then, then we've got natural gas. Natural gas is an important fuel for our electricity system when the renewables aren't there, but natural gas is also use for industry and also for heating. Then we move on to coal and peat. We used to use a lot of coal for electricity generation, but we still use a lot of coal and peat now for heating our homes. And then we come to my side with the, with the renewables. We've got clean renewables like wind, a little bit of solar in there as well. And bioenergy, here we have a piece of wood, but bioenergy essentially represents energy that we grow. And bioenergy and renewables together represent about 10% of all our energy use. I like how you call this your end. You get to claim the renewables and I get all of, of this. 
Surely this isn't what we want, this isn't what we're aiming for. Yeah, this side of the table, you know, almost 80% of our energy is fossil fuel, and most of that energy actually comes from abroad. We rely on countries like Norway, we rely on countries like the UK, even further afield to get most of our energy from. And is this because we don't have the capacity to increase your end of the table? Yeah, and this is a crazy thing. You know, if you look at it, we have, we have very little of this stuff, we have loads of this stuff. We have tons of potential for clean, renewable energy in Ireland, and we have really active ecosystems in Ireland. So we could actually grow a lot more energy in Ireland as well. But what we need to do is move as much away from fossil fuels as we can, which is good because that means we are going to be stopping importing more fuels and produce most of our energy at home from clean, renewable resources. And that's ultimately a very good thing for Ireland and it's a very good thing for our economy. But to reap the benefits, Paul's table needs a few changes. Some oil will be required for planes and industry, but we need electric alternatives for cars and heat because oil needs to drop by 80%. The same is true for natural gas. It should fall by 50%. By switching to electric heat to warm our homes, coal and peat need to go all together. So Paul, I've removed a lot of my fossil fuels your end's still looking pretty light. Is this going to be enough energy to sustain us? We spent time reducing energy, now we need to look at ways to increase our energy. And what we need is a lot more of renewable energy, such as wind and such as bioenergy. These changes will require a massive increase in demand for clean electricity. For this, our government have plans to massively boost wind energy, primarily through new offshore farms and bioenergy may also need to play an increased role. So the 12 million we spend every day on this could move towards this? Exactly, you know, that's a win-win for Ireland. Instead of sending money out of the country to bring energy in, I want to keep that money in Ireland and keep the energy in Ireland. So Paul, it, it looks good. Will this be enough to sustain us? This would be a remarkable change and we need to do all these things, but it probably won't be enough. The challenge with the picture that we're looking at at the moment, we had lots of fossil fuels, which is very much influenced by geopolitics and all that stuff, but actually the system that we have at the moment will be very much influenced by weather. And if there isn't enough weather in this part of the world, we need something else to fill that balance and step in and meet our energy needs. Now we have a couple of choices. We could look at something like building way more wind energy and using the excess to produce clean energy carriers like hydrogen. That's something that's really exciting at the moment. There's uncertainty there around maybe the costs around the logistics and the whole cost of that infrastructure. That's one choice. And we could also look at things like traditional fossil fuels, something like natural gas, and linking it with technology that breaks the molecule of gas apart and puts the, 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 the piece that damages the atmosphere back in the ground and keeps a useful piece for energy. That's called carbon capture and storage. Again, there's uncertainty there on the technology and around the cost. And then we could look at something like nuclear. There's a lot of exciting research being done globally at the moment around small modular nuclear reactors. Of course, the uncertainty there is around, again, technology development and costs, but more importantly, the willingness of the public to support it and politically to accept it. But it's important to remember that, that those choices that we have, at the moment, they're pretty uncertain. We're not really sure which choice we have to make, but none of those choices mean that we shouldn't stop doing what we're doing in Ireland. We need to continue the development of renewables in Ireland because we're really so far behind from where we need to be. Decarbonising our economy could benefit Ireland, but not without massive government investment. The question is, will some be left behind Our government has made a commitment to decarbonising our economy. But what will it mean for you and me? Could it make our lives harder? One of the most divisive discussions around decarbonising our economy centres around what might be lost as we move away from fossil fuels. Now, the programme for government has a phrase that comes up over and over again. It's a pledge to make the decarbonisation process as fair as possible a just transition. Our jobs, homes, the way we get around, even our food, could look very different. Many are anxious these changes will make their lives more difficult and bring extra costs. Whether switching to public transport or buying an electric car, paying for expensive home retrofits or new taxes on heating fuels, there's reason for concern. So I've come to meet Dr. Hannah Daly, 
who's been studying what a just transition needs to look like. Anna, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today was this idea of a just transition. Can you explain that to me? Sure. So. Our energy system goes into every part of our life and the economy. Energy is required to manufacture all the things that we use every day, even to heat our cups of tea. So we need to completely transform how we make, how we use uh, energy in this country. And this concept of a just transition is an acknowledgement that with such a big transition, some people could lose out if it's not done in a, in a careful way. How might some of these, these transitions or these changes affect, you know, the individual, you or me, in our houses? So I think a lot of people are worried that, um, that it will make uh, energy more expensive. And that is a very important worry because over a third of homes in Ireland are in what's known as fuel poverty, where people have to spend too much money to heat their homes. And that means their homes are damp, drafty, poorly insulated, and they spend too much on fossil fuels. If we don't design this energy transition in a way that ensures that people ha um, have affordable energy as well as clean energy and low carbon energy, then it won't work. I wonder, is moving towards a sustainable energy future going to make it harder for people to live? Is this going to disimprove people's lives? For warmer homes is, is such a huge um, part of quality of life. You're a doctor, you know that you know drafty damp homes increases uh, deaths uh, in the winter uh, from, from pneumonia and things like that. And you know, 1,500 people die every year in Ireland because of air pollution from cars, from, from burning uh, fuel in, a, in our chimneys. So if we look at the positives, moving away from dirty fuels, making our homes warmer, there's so, much, so many benefits that can come from this energy transition. And I certainly agree it would be nice not to have these cars flying up and down <laughs> beside us as we chat. A fair transition could have benefits for all of us. But for some, their very livelihoods will be threatened. Entire industries will wind down, potentially at short notice, losing a way of life that has sustained communities for decades. Some changes may come quickly in the process of decarbonising our economy, and that transition may go quite smoothly. But I want to see what happens when more contentious industries try to create a just transition. Peat production is Ireland's largest fossil fuel industry. It's used for power generation and to heat our homes. It's also devastating for the environment. Draining and harvesting peat is destructive for biodiversity, while burning it is harder on the climate even than coal. For years, EcoEye has reported the debate surrounding the end of the peat harvest. In 2017, Duncan visited Board Namona to question Joe Lane about their timelines. We're looking to move down a path to eliminate ourselves from burning peat in power generation by 2030. That's a really strong commitment. And so, by the way, can I interrupt yes. you there? You would have the option to close down the plant or, or mothball it. Have you considered that um, now, immediately? No, we haven't considered that. Why not? Because we have a commitment to our uh, responsibility to our workforce and our communities and our focus is to transition rather than come to an abrupt stop. There's been drastic change since Duncan's visit. 2019 marked the end of a 100 million euro publicly funded subsidy given to the peat industry every year. So I've come back to talk to Joe Lane to understand Board Namona's new vision for the future. We were here in 2017 with EcoI. What has changed in Borden Amona since then? In 2018, we sat down and we reflected on where we were. And out of that, we developed what we've called our brown to green strategy. And really that's about narrowing our focus a little. We see our future in renewable power generation. We see our future in, in the circular economy through our waste business. And as we move into restoration, moving from a peat production landscape that was releasing carbon uh, into a landscape that's going to create significant biodiversity and carbon sequestration. 
And when are you hoping to stop harvesting peat from the bogs? We suspended our peat harvesting operations in June and that was because of the uncertainty around peat regulation and planning. Once we're clear, we'll then determine uh, the precise exit. But our intention is to aggressively drive down uh, peat harvesting and bring that to an end uh, well in advance of what we had originally communicated as 2030. Joe, what's changed then to accelerate the reduction in peat harvesting that Borden Manor want to do? The awareness uh, of the climate crisis is probably the most significant driver. We're a servant of the state and there's a national agenda now to get towards carbon neutrality by 2050 and Borden Mona is challenged to play a leading part in that journey. We can't tell the future but obviously climate change is coming and clearly you're reacting. What does this mean for other peat production factories in going forward? So there's been a lot of uh, controversy and a lot of unease between employees and communities because of the changes. We've had some employees leave on voluntary redundancy, but those employees that remain will now move into the restoration activity. And we see that as being a stable employment base for uh, the next four to five years and into the future. It's clear from scientists that peat extraction and burning is completely incompatible with our climate change targets. While at the time of my visit, harvesting had only stopped temporarily, this move will be made permanent and that it will happen well in advance of 2030 is something I'm really glad to see. We need to move away from this dirty fuel. But I do wonder how the transition has been viewed by former peat harvesters now working to rehabilitate the bogs. So I've ventured out into the bog to meet with machine operator Pascal Foley. When you first started working for Board de Mono, what were you doing? Uh, first out, I was on uh, peat production. And are you still doing that today? Uh, no, it has stopped this year, so it's, uh, production has ceased. And what are you doing now? Um, I, as you can see, what I, I'm at here, I'm working uh, regenerating the bog here. And the change has been quite fast for you then, I suppose, hasn't it really? Yeah, well, the change has been, well, all board them all, all staff, all from top to bottom, like things have snowballed, like, you know, when I started with was meetings in 2030, 2027, 25, 23, kept dropping in this year, it bombshell, it just stopped. We all knew it wasn't an indefined time, it wasn't, it wasn't going to last forever, but it just came as a big shock. Do you see the point of stopping the peat harvesting and, and moving to restoration? I definitely I can see the point of the restorations of the bog. I probably won't live to see the results of it, but down the road, yeah, it, it will be beneficial. In 2020 alone, two peat-fired power plants closed, leaving over a thousand employees in transition. But at the same time, a new government fund aimed at rehabilitating the bog has opened to make the transition easier. We need to see this shift not as a loss, but as the beginning of a new green route for our economy. With everyone I've talked to while examining the ideas held in the Programme for Government, I've been encouraged to find so many people determined to push for change. Young people especially are genuinely worried about the future of the planet and they want to do something, they want policymakers to make a change, they want a better energy system. We have to roll up our sleeves and we have to start doing this. But we need to start now rather than, rather than delaying the process. I think the media need to tell a different story about the climate emergency rather than kind of presenting everything as it's a threat to the farmers or it's a threat to industry or it's a threat to this and presenting everything as a zero-sum game. It's not, right? Everybody can collectively win from this. Our response to the COVID-19 pandemic showed how quickly citizens and government can create change. We need the same urgency in response to the climate crisis. We all want Ireland to be the greenest country it can be, and the programme for government seems to want this too. Whether it's political jargon or not, when it comes to tackling climate change, we do need a common purpose, especially our government. Our future is at stake.